Good evening. Wow. If we knew it was that easy to get silence in a classroom, we would just dim the lights. It works really well. My name is Mary Grace Simcox, and I am the president of the Pennsylvania College of Health Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. We are very excited to share our mission here for the college, which is the excellence in healthcare practice and leadership and the continuous acquisition of knowledge. And tonight's vehicle for doing that is our annual distinguished lecture. I am so pleased to welcome David France as this year's notable speaker. David is a best-selling author, filmmaker, and contributing editor for New York Magazine. His landmark documentary film, How to Survive a Plague, was nominated for an Oscar, won a Director's Guild Award, and a Peabody Award and was nominated for two Emmys. We probably saw him on TV. His latest book, a New York Times notable book for 2016, also called How to Survive a Plague, made over a dozen best books of the year, won the ALA's Israel Fishman Nonfiction Award for 2017, and top honors from Labda Literary and the Publishers Triangle, and was long listed for the Welcome Prize in Literature and the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence. This year, Netflix released his newest film, The Death and Life of Marcia P. Johnson. David will be discussing how to apply the lessons learned from the AIDS crisis to today's improbable world of science doubting, media accountability, and political turmoil. I've had the pleasure of spending some time with David, as has many of our students here today, and I know that you are in for a real treat. So it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage David France. Thank you. That was really lovely. Uh, thank you, President Simcox, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you, especially to the trustees and students of the Pennsylvania College for, of Health Sciences, uh, having me here today to talk about AIDS. Um, I would like to start. I hope we're showing you a clip. <laughs> Yes. 
Mr. Mayor, in campaigning for the lesbian and gay vote in an election year, a bit of historical context is necessary in dealing with the AIDS crisis in New York City. It wasn't until 1983 that you met with people to deal with the AIDS crisis. How do you respond to these criticisms? That is uh, falsehood. Please, anybody who's, who's thinking about being arrested, fill out a support sheet. Make sure that your support person knows who you are and what group you're in. Yeah. Um, if we end up in the tombs, is there a, like a queer tank there? And would you recommend that we ask to be there? There is a homo tank, and I've been there, and it's better than the straight tank, let me tell you. Uh, who else? Yes. Yeah. In the past, you've described ACT UP as fascist. Yeah, in the press release, you called them concerned citizens. Well, uh, I was wondering what changed your mind. I, I don't think that you, you uh, can't use both. Uh, fascists can be concerned citizens. <laughs> Um, and um, I don't believe they are fascists. I think they have used a fascist tactic. Let us celebrate together tonight the end of the last day on which Ed Koch can tell himself that the communities which are being decimated by this epidemic are so weak and so divided among themselves that he can keep serving us this kind of bullshit. Tomorrow <laughs> morning, he will begin to learn the truth. <laughs> Jim Igo for the Treatment Issues Committee of ACT UP. Jim, what specific treatment issues are being brought into this demonstration this week? The municipal hospitals are totally falling apart. More than half the people who get diagnosed with AIDS today get diagnosed in the emergency rooms of our city. You're going to find yourself waiting four days in an emergency room before you get a bed. I just love all these people, and I think that what we're doing is really right. And I mean, listen to this, and look at all the people. It's just really wonderful, and it's worth putting yourself on the line. There is no accurate diagnosis. There are incentives in the city hospitals not to diagnose people with AIDS, and therefore people don't get treated. We are angry at the way this city has handled this crisis, and we demand that it touch, exert leadership, and declare a state of emergency. Go in the street now or wait. Those are the options. One. He says go. He says now. Three. Go. Go now, Koch. We're standing here with Larry Kramer. What is ACT UP trying to say today to Ed Koch? We're sending a message to public officials, to closeted public officials, that we won't be shot on anymore, and obviously all the AIDS issues. I would love to see, like, more cameras or something, you know, for our own protection. Can everyone hear his concern? People die every day. Friends get sick every day. I don't, it's like being in the trenches. And there is such anger in the community, and it, it is coalescing in a way that has never been done before. Okay, which way do we face, girlfriends? This way or that way?
survive a plague. <clears throat> One, in the beginning. HIV is a thing so small it takes a special microscope to see it. Compact, audacious, and wily viruses and retroviruses are the tiniest of life forms. Though calling them life forms at all is to enter into a debate. On the one hand, they carry genetic material like all living things, but they are incapable of autonomous life. For survival and for reproduction, they must invade the healthy cells of animals or plants. No other organism is so fundamentally dependent upon its hosts. Historians have put forth numerous explanations for their existence, from simple Darwinian selection of the fittest to the more recent observation that viruses, which are now known to add genetic material to the surviving hosts, might be the secret tool of adaptive evolution. But for most, they engender very little respect. The South African virologist Edward Rybicki disparaged them as organisms at the end of, edge of life. But the tiny HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, managed to challenge our humanity in a way nothing before it had. As a community, as a nation, as a species, history will judge us harshly for the way that AIDS was initially handled and in too many cases continues to be handled. I remember what it was like in the early minutes of the epidemic. I moved to New York City as a young gay man in the spring of 1981. By that summer, there were 41 known cases. What an amazing figure that is. On July 3rd, 1981, in all the world, public health authorities recognized only a few dozen people stricken by the virus. Today, that number is 80 million. Half of them, 40 million people, are dead. It's heartbreaking to think that this didn't have to happen, that HIV was containable once. Can you imagine what might have been had we responded to the epidemic humanely. But we squandered that opportunity. I saw it happen in astonishing real time. Political leaders in New York and Washington who rejected science in favor of hatred and bigotry. Religious leaders, not from the fringes, but from the most powerful pulpits in the nation, who celebrated the suffering wrought by AIDS as the handiwork of a just God. It took an enormous and unprecedented effort to change all of that, to refile AIDS as a medical problem, not a political or a moral one, to cleanse it of hatred. But I'm jumping ahead in the story. I think this, there is a tendency when looking back at the plague years to jump ahead, to shorthand the story in this way. A mysterious new virus arrived, many people died, and then it got better. I'm going to fill in some of the blanks. I arrived to New York with my college roommate and my good friend, Brian Goujon. Unbeknownst to us, at the time we had joined the largest mass migration of LGBTQ people in world history. People who were sparked as we were by the promise of freedom represented in small pockets of a few cities besides mine, Amsterdam, Paris, Toronto, San Francisco. This wasn't a true freedom. Homosexuality was still illegal in most states in the country and the number of cities with gay rights protections numbered less than a dozen. There were no openly gay people on television, no openly gay reporters, no openly gay elected officials. The one exception was Harvey Milk, who had been voted into office in San Francisco in 1978, only to be assassinated before the year was up. We treated our gay ghettos where we were as a people we retreated to our gay ghettos where we were, as a people, entirely detached from civic life. The first report in the New York Times was brief and buried on page A20, an overflow page, a junk drawer, really, surrounded by advertisements. It took the paper another two years, when 600 were already dead, to put the plague on the front page. And it took another two years before any drug was put into human trials, such was the lack of empathy and concern for the dying. Even the profit motive, that all-American engine driver, had stood down. That year, 1985, President Ronald Reagan still had never said a word about the crisis in public. And the leader of the 14.3 million member Southern Baptist Convention told us that, quote, AIDS is God indicating his displeasure. 
a thesis that was made more prominent by the Reverend Jerry Falwell, then among the most influential people in American life. Quote, AIDS is not just God's punishment for homosexuals, Falwell said. It is God's punishment for a society that tolerates homosexuals. And Americans followed him. A national poll that fall found that nearly a third of Americans had changed their opinions about the community for the worse since the onset of AIDS. The Los Angeles Times reported that our political heyday, as they called it, was over, when in truth, what we tumbled from was only the bottom rung. And we were still routinely turned away from hospitals, fired from jobs on suspicion of illness, and ignored by the mainstream press entirely. Even after death, the horrors continued. The majority of undertakers refused our corpses. Can you imagine? The plague burned on in this way for six full years before any drug reached the pharmacies. AZT, it was called, and it did almost nothing to extend life. It was not until year 15 of the AIDS epidemic, a decade and a half of mass death, that effective medicine was brought to market, turning an HIV infection into a manageable condition as it is today. By then, just in the city that Brian and I had adopted as home, 100,000 people were dead, including Brian himself. That's as many, as, Ameri as many young Americans as died in the tragedy that was the Vietnam War in New York City alone. And most of them were from within our gay ghetto, an area no larger than a single square mile. Two, the dawn of AIDS activism. I mentioned before that life inside the ghettos offered a facsimile of freedom. Inside these compounds, a new kind of patient activism began almost from the start in two cities simultaneously. In the Castro district in San Francisco, a young man named Bobby Campbell, by training a nurse, by temperament, a gender-bending and flamboyant figure of some local renown, was one of the first in his city to be diagnosed with Kaposi's sarcoma, the rare skin cancer that was one of the markers of the disease. He photographed his lesions and posted the pictures in the window of Star Pharmacy at the crossroads of the ghetto so that others would know what to look for. In Greenwich Village in New York, Richard Berkowitz and Michael Callan published a piece in the local paper, reveal, local gay paper, revealing that their own health complications as a signpost for others. They did this, as has been said, as leaders without portfolio. Michael Callan was trained as a singer and a songwriter, and Richard Berkowitz, the only one of the three still alive today, worked as a well-paid and highly sought-after prostitute. What they had in common was a fierce desire to save as many people as possible. They were collectively known back then as the poster boys of the early AIDS epidemic, though they had not joined forces yet. In their separate spheres, absent any insight or input from the US Public Health Service, they developed theories of what might be causing their disease. The New York duo suspected immune overload caused by an onslaught of, onslaught of common sexually transmitted diseases, they thought. In San Francisco, the thinking went to viruses long before HIV was discovered. Prevention would be the same either way. Callan and Berkowitz called it safer sex and promoted it in a book that they called How to Have Sex in an Epidemic. The secret, they argued, was to avoid exposure to bodily fluids, especially through the proper use of condoms. It's hard to imagine today that safe sex had to be invented, but that's just what Callan and Berkowitz did. To their great surprise, the self-published tract received a rave in the highbrow New York Review of Books, of all places, which in turn prompted the B. Dalton bookseller chain to create window displays around the work. Grateful letters came in from Europe, Asia, and Australia. A television news producer in West Germany traveled to New York just to interview them. Their message had gone viral, even without the, inter the invention of the World Wide Web. Bobby Campbell's approach was the same. His brochure was titled Play Fair, a cartoon illustrated call to condom use. It was distributed free of charge by a destructive performance group that called themselves the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Overnight in gay neighborhoods around the globe, rubbers took off. They were everywhere. At doctor's offices, they were given out like lollipops. Jars full of them proliferated in every gay bar and bathhouse. 
One night on Christopher Street, I watched a team of lesbians on a flatbed truck lovingly hurl the things into the air like rose petals over the heads of their gay brothers. Manufacturers caught on to the sudden surge in demand and began producing them in every imaginable color, in flavors, in textures, in foils that looked like chocolates or coins or little flying saucers. So firmly did condoms take hold that summer along the nighttime cruising concourses of the West Side Piers that they led to the proliferation in the lapping tides of what came to be called Hudson River Whitefish. As soon became indisputable, transmission rates for all known sexually transmitted diseases slowed dramatically. Among gay men, gonorrhea diagnoses were down 73% in San Francisco and more than 50% in New York. By igniting a craze for safer sex, the activists on both coasts did more to save lives than anything anybody had done before. Perhaps tens of thousands of new infections were averted, all without a whisper of endorsement or concern from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. These three men and a growing number of their collaborators went on to create a ghetto-based medical response to the disease with the creation of underground medical journals, amateur medical clinics, illegal pharmacies for importing drugs from other countries that might hold promise against the disease, in 1988, they even mounted the first ever and only, as far as I know, underground drug trial, pushing a cucumber extract from China into the arms of volunteers. Sadly, the revol results were bad and may have hastened death. They did all of this clear-eyed and honestly. We're giving people hope, if nothing else, Michael Callan told me. It's hopelessness that kills. Soon, millions of dollars worth of hope was moving through those secret pharmacies, and life expectancy remained stubbornly short. I remind you of all of this because it was the necessary backdrop, the facts on the ground at the beginning of 1987, when the film begins, six years into the epidemic, when a new kind of grassroots activism dawned. Overnight, arresting posters appeared on every available wall and bus shelter in our ghetto, an anonymous collective of artists had been working on an image that they hoped would galvanize the community into something. Against a back black drop was a pink triangle, a reminder of how gays were mar marked by the Nazis. And the bold words, silence equals death. This message, so ominous and vague, yet we all knew what it meant. Surely we were all doomed on the current course. But it was more difficult to puzzle through what these posters were asking us to do. The slogan suggested a corollary. We knew what the opposite of death was, but what kind of non-silence? The fuse was set, and a few weeks later, the writer Larry Kramer struck a match. In these six years, Kramer had risen to become our leader of sorts, our Martin Luther King. He'd been invited to be a last minute substitute for a lecture series at the city's lesbian and gay community center. Through word of mouth, the event was standing room only. The actor Martin Sheen was there, and this was a surprise, but his best friend, the best man at his wedding, had died of AIDS earlier that day and he couldn't sit home. The word of mouth had reached all the way to him. Kramer began, our continued existence on the face of this earth as gay men is at stake. Unless we fight for our lives, we shall die. In all the history of homosexuality, we have never before been so close to death and extinction. He used his hand to divide up a large portion of, the, portion of the room. He asked them to stand, and then he told them, at the rate we are going, you could be dead in less than five years. Two thirds of this room will be dead in less than five years. At that moment, already on their feet, a remarkable direct action initiative pulled together. Within days, it would adopt a name, ACT UP, for AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, and, recognition that, and, a, and a recognition that was deceptively simple. We were not going to survive this by creating a parallel world of science and medicine. It was time to tear down the ghetto, ghetto walls and demand action from the public health institutions that had been responding to our plight with hostile indifference. 
As a journalist, I covered what they were doing closely. I wrote one of the first stories about ACT UP. I went to their meetings and demonstrations for a decade. I'm going to admit that I didn't find all the members to be very likable. There was a certain shrillness to those meetings and those stagey demonstrations. As Newsweek noted, they deliberately trespassed the bounds of good taste. Often they showed an irritating disregard for the humanity of others, bigots, especially cops often, sometimes scientists and healthcare workers themselves. And there was their self-satisfied self smugness. But these flaws could be excused, or at least I excused them, as they were coming from dying men. None of us expected to get out of this alive. Given our sealed fate, in retrospect, it's hard to begrudge anyone a little smugness. I'm going to give you some examples, some better recalled than others. They entered the seat of the Roman Catholic Church in America, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, crumbled a consecrated host and threw it to the floor. They infiltrated a fundraiser for George H.W. Bush, the first George Bush, dressed as good Republican ladies, though on closer inspection, they included many men. And they unfurled a banner that read, Lesbians for Bush. It was an insider's joke. <laughs> Most of the audience didn't get it. They tampered with a presentation of their health commissioner by slipping slides into his carousel, this was before PowerPoints, that read, he's lying during his presentation. They barged into live news broadcasts. They held up ordinary commuting traffic at the Golden Gate Bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Lincoln Tunnel, at Union Station, at Grand Central Station, just as you saw in that clip. For almost a decade, there was such a noisy nuisance that most people in the country recall them only as an unnecessary sideshow from the plague years. Even every gay organization of the day denounced them. But what wasn't clear on the ground was that this chaotic public strategy was matched by another wing under the guidance of a retired pharmaceutical researcher, Dr. Iris Long. Iris was one of those marvelous figures that you encounter in novels and in movies and almost never in real life. An outsider among outsiders, a stodgy and middle-aged woman who had never met a gay person in her life, who had never volunteered for any cause, who was not at all politically radical, but who knew a little something about drug science and was driven to help. It took weeks to discern her purpose. Her lack of erudition was distracting. She was all ums and stutters, with an enervating habit of introducing sentences but neglecting to provide their middles or their ends. What words were intelligible to us tended to be arranged into pure scientific, scientific gibberish, or so it seemed. But one by one, members of ACT UP joined her in weekly study sessions, becoming her accolades and her soldiers. None of them had any formal training. There were, they included a student of Russian literature, a failed actor, a social worker, a nightclub club promoter, a number of school dropouts, including one who was just 16. They read and quizzed one another on immunology and trial designs, on the workings of the FDA, and the budgetary honeycombs at the NIH. Their initial goal was to master the language of science so that they might engage the researchers. What they accomplished, though, was much more than that. The little committee that Iris Long founded went on to become full partners in the research that produced the game-changing medications in 1996. And they created a paradigm of patient activism, of citizen science that is commonplace today, not just in AIDS, but in nearly every disease. Three, structural reform. The legacy of ACT UP is a lasting one. At the beginning of AIDS, it took, on average, seven to 10 years for a drug to go from test tubes to FDA approval. By 1996, through their interventions and their insights, that period had been pushed down to as short as six months. This was thanks to one of these citizen scientists, Spencer Cox, then a 28-year-old AIDS patient, trained as an actor. He designed the protocol adopted by industry that allowed new drugs to produce reliable efficacy findings very quickly. Spencer Cox saved lives. Double-blind placebo, placebo control trials 
then the gold standard in all drug research, are no longer used in the case of invariably fatal diseases. I was this committee denounced them as immoral death files, and worse, unreliable science. That's because in desperation, people with AIDS were using an underground network of lab technicians to test their pills and determine whether or not they were on placebo. Patients on placebo that would then quit the study and enroll in another one and try again. The trials were producing bad data as a result. This would not change until placebos were removed entirely and the patient population developed enough trust that their lives were not being endangered for an outmoded, outmoded scientific principle. They also demanded immediate access to experimental drugs once they'd been proven safe and theoretically effective. That, that is, as soon as phase one trials were completed. At first, the pharmaceutical companies opposed this, citing expense and risk, but ACT UP saw in pharmaceutical researchers natural and necessary allies, not, not enemies. They were able to identify and empower a kind of official activism among their ranks. Transformative revolutionary activism took place in all corners of the formal, formal AIDS response. And in 1994 and 1995, when the dying was at its worst, Iris's army approached one drug company in particular, Merck and Company, with a proposal. They asked to join the research for a new class of drugs called protease inhibitors, not just as trial subjects, but as community advisors on everything from the design of clinical trials to the drug manufacturing process. With threats of mass demonstrations, Merck nervously agreed, and it made all the difference in the world. Together, they identified the specific compound that would be called Crixivan, the miracle medication that arrived in drug cocktails in 1996 and literally emptied AIDS wards across the country. AIDS activists reviewed factory blueprints and designed the drug's initial market rollouts. Using Spencer Cox's trial design, Crixivan proved to be the one. Today, worldwide, nearly 20 million people are alive thanks to this breakthrough. And AIDS activists have since gained a place at the table at every, every major pharmaceutical company where they sit on formal community advisory boards, CABs. They created a brand new role for patients. And today, members of nearly every disease community have that same access, have their own CABs. Across the board, patients and their advocates are now full partners in every aspect of research and treatment. ACTUP can also claim credit for launching the first clean needle exchange program uh, uh, to prevent transmission among IV drug users and bringing the lawsuits that helped create legal protections in the epidemic and forcing the Centers for Disease Control to abandon a definition of the disease that, for some reason, excluded women. The organization launched the largest AIDS housing project in the world and directly expired, inspired the Americans with Disabilities Act and, yes, the Affordable Care Act. But their towering achievement is in helping to modernize everything about the way medicine is practiced, science, scientific research is undertaken, and drugs are researched and regulated. That legacy is something we take for granted today without knowing the names of the people who brought us there. Theirs is a magisterial contribution to humanity. This is a quintessentially American story, the idea that individuals, even the most disenfranchised and despised among us, can change the course of history. The idea that triumph is possible, the idea that our history really does bend toward justice. But it's not this, enough to say that it got better. I beg you to remember these stories of darkness and of victory against the odds. None of this happened without a mass movement of desperate patients and their allies in government and in business. Unbelievably, we find ourselves in another area when science is being subjugated to a bankrupt ideology, when environmental protections are scrapped and healthcare is restricted and politicized, when research findings are buried and scientific conclusions are denied. Let us not be silent. Let us study the blueprint and inspiration of AIDS activism and plot a strategy forward. I turn to Dr. Sam Broder, a pioneering AIDS researcher and a government employee who says, many people in the United States 
don't recall what it was like 25 or 30 years ago. I think that's a good thing because it's a sign that we made progress. But if by unremembering the bad parts, we also unremembering the good parts, that's a tragedy. Four, the condition of survival. I bring you now to 2013, well past the plague years of AIDS, and to the pages of How to Survive a Plague. The experience of death, which had bound them together a quarter century ago, unexpectedly reunited them on an unseasonably warm January afternoon. They made their way down East 32nd Street in Manhattan just after two o'clock, wending sedately toward the stark black doorway of the cutting room, a performance space hosting the memorial service for Spencer Cox, one of the country's most recognizable AIDS activists. Long before the glass doors swung open, a line stretched down the block. Taxicabs deposited luminaries from the worlds of science and medicine, of theater, advertising, and media, of activism, art, and academia, people from all over the United States, from Europe, from Africa. Many of them were hollow-cheeked and balanced on canes or on one another, slowed by age or disease or a reluctance to re-enter the community of the grieving. Even the nimble among them wore haunted expressions. If you knew what to look for, you saw in their faces the burden of a shared past, the years and years of similar services. This is what survivors of the plague look like. The crowd swelled to 500. Some among them were adorned in mementos, faded protest buttons or t-shirts with militant slogans. This was the generation that fought AIDS from the dawn of the global pandemic. Most had been members or supporters of ACT UP. That movement collapsed in the mid 90s when the effective medicine arrived and finally staunched much of the dying. In the decades since, it had seemed that the menace had receded, at least in America, but death convoked them once again. Few people personified the epidemic's long history in America more than Cox. A college dropout, he was just 20 years old when he got his grim diagnosis. Given only a few months to live, he threw himself into ACT UP, uh, where, uh, where patients and their advocates puzzled through the science of virology, chemistry, and immunology. A consummate networker, Cox illustrated the developing science by submitting his own health complications to the scrutiny of reporters. In his drive to give the disease a face, he kept no aspect of his life with HIV off stage, not his rapid viral mutations, his enlarging lymph nodes, or the cruel or the humiliating and painful diarrhea that regularly sidelined him, or the cruel complication that turned his left eye cloudy and useless. This was how I first met him. In the winter of 1988, he brought me his latest laboratory results to help describe how certain experimental drugs were thought to work and how, in fact, they routinely failed. We met in a coffee shop late in the morning. Short and smooth-faced, with dark eyes and floppy black hair, he arrived Brando-style, in industrial work boots, jeans tight as a sunburn, a black leather bomber jacket over a white t-shirt, the official uniform of ACT UP. His youth disarmed me. He looked like a teenager, not yet able to grow a beard, but his, he displayed a researcher's grasp with his own cellular tapestry and a facility for render, rendering complex immunological principles into everyday language. He was anything but self-pitying. Reaching into a canvas army surplus bag, he spun a sheath of his lab results across the table, accompanied by a line from Betty Davis that was utterly lost on me. Until recently, Cox had learned much of what he knew from the movies, especially from the 40s and the 50s or the theater, which had been the subject of his aborted education. Over the ensuing years, he became a principal source for much of my AIDS reporting and a, a most, among the most effective treatment advocates in the field. Since that stunning breakthrough in 1996, the new treatments had reached millions of people worldwide, returning them to the promise of a near normal life. Some had been just breaths away from their own deaths, but after a few weeks on treatment, they rose from their hospital beds and against all reasonable expectation, went home to resume an ordinary life. So dramatic was their res resurrection that stupefied doctors began calling it the Lazarus effect. And yet the pharmaceutical marvels that Cox fought so hard to bring into existence failed him in the end. 
His infection proved to be resistant to many of the drug combinations. The country's best doctors tinkered with what they called salvage regimens specifically for him, accomplishing numerous barely in time rescues. For over half of his life, Cox careened from one medical trauma to another, maintaining his dark, darkly comic facade, though in recent years he had grown weary. The last time I saw him, he spoke of feeling run down. When he checked into the hospital a few weeks later, his viral load was uh, overbearing and his T cell count, which had been in the healthy range, had sunk to just 30, putting him at risk for a host of fatal diseases. Doctors diagnosed hypoglycemia and severe pneumonia. By the following Tuesday, 44 years old, but racked and worn as a guerrilla commandant, he died from multiple complications of AIDS. So went the global AIDS pandemic in its fourth decade. A precise number of the dead can't be fixed as the majority have fallen in areas of sub-Saharan Africa unknown to doctors or census takers. At the time of Cox's death, the body count was as high as 40 million, which is nearly twice the devastation of the bubonic plague that questioned all of humanity in the 14th century. In the United States, the official count was 658,507 by the end of 2012, an approximate figure despite its ring of precision. In the early years, especially many people were declared dead from other causes in order to spare their relatives from stigma or because doctors mistook their symptoms or the diseased went down, the, de the deceased went down as suicide statistics instead, having chosen pills or bullets or the high rise window over the inevitable. The year Cox died, 13,711 other Americans were claimed by AIDS. As in the epidemic's very first year, most belonged to communities that were stigmatized, marginalized, feared, hated. Cox had begun his journey through the plague as a gay man at a time when most Americans supported laws criminalizing homosexuality. He finished his life entirely dependent upon social services and on probation for a criminal conviction after a descent into common drug addiction. Few of his old colleagues knew about Cox's last days. The members of, the ACT, Up, of ACT Up had drifted far apart in recent years. Even Cox's old HIV positive support group, men who had relied upon one another in the way one does in wartime and made a blood vow to be at one another's side when the time came, had scattered. When we realized we weren't going to die, said David Barr, who convened the support group, instead we all got sick of one another. That could not have been foreseen at the support group's height. In the epic struggle for survival, su survival that consumed the plague years, these men, Barr, an attorney by training, Peter Staley, a former bank bond trader, Greg Bordowitz, an experimental filmmaker, Derek Link, a one-time bookstore clerk, Mark Harrington, a film archivist. They were among the most recognized generals, the architects and administrators of the movement, movement's public health strategy. Successive presidential administrations sought their insights. Nobel Prize winners adopted their critiques. Embracing their reputation for arrogance, insolence, and prominence, they had jokingly named themselves the HIVIPs. That anyone with HIV had a chance for ordinary life was thanks to the work that they accomplished. Yet their extraordinary journeys, journeys had rendered them mostly unprepared for an ordinary life. In countless ways, survival, unexpected as it was, proved as hard to adjust to as the plague itself. Many in the at-risk communities shared this paradox, whether or not they'd been infected themselves. Nobody left those years uncorrupted by what they'd witnessed, not only from the mass deaths. Such betrayal would be impossible to forget in the subsequent years, and as when the gates of Auschwitz were thrown open at last, this new era only made it possible to finally, to finally grasp the hideousness of what came before. So for us, wrote Primo Levi about his own liberation, even the hour of victory rang out grave and muffled and filled our souls with joy and yet with painful sense of prudency so that we should have liked to wash our consciences and our memories clean from the foulness that lay upon them, and also with anguish, because we felt that this should never have happened. 
now, that now nothing could ever happen good and pure enough to rub out our past, and that the scars of the outrage would remain within us forever. The burden of memory was something Cox spoke about with deep insight. Sensing its toll on the mental health of us survivors, he formed a new organization to bring attention to this second crucible. In our hour of victory, depression and isolation were expanding problems. So was a syndrome called survivor's guilt, an idea that bound those of us who remained more to the dead than to the living. Cox saw all of this coming. He issued white papers, he penned op-eds, but despite these efforts, he was unable to, to spark interest from researchers or funders, much less of the generation of gays who never experienced the plague. His new organization withered and he sank into his own deep depression and isolation. I remained closer to him than most of his friends over the final year. In our last conversation, he bitterly complained that the community that inherited the advances he helped wrought, who lived integrated lives as gay citizens, citizens, who went on to fight for marriage equality and against discrimination in the military, whether or not they'd been infected, had abandoned his generation and forgotten the events that had shaped them. He felt erased. His suffering, which in the past had enlightened the public and challenged science, suddenly insignificant. His new policy was to talk as little about his personal health as possible. It wasn't until after he died that I learned that Cox, a regular poster on the website Gawker, used a known diploma to describe his agony in the final months. Some days I'm fine and get around no problem, he wrote. Other days I'm curled in the fetal position in bed the whole day, racked with pain the whole time. Some days I'm on the subway getting the stink eye from some old or pregnant lady who clearly wants my seat and can't just tell by looking at me that I'm sitting because I'm on the way home from a doctor's appointment and if I stood for one more minute, I would have to fall to the floor. When grieving friends were packing away Cox's possessions after his death, they found a shocking sight, a shelf of unopened medicine bottles and a drawer of unfilled prescriptions. Cox had apparently stopped taking the hard-worn medicine, accounting for his quick demise. Angry speculation about this consumed his friends, by most, but most agreed it signaled a post-trauma syndrome unique to survivors. In uh, many of the 500 people entering the cutting room recognized that they shared the symptoms. In the tradition of the movement, people in line accorded it an irreverent name, AIDS Survivor Syndrome, or ASS, but they took it very seriously. When it was time, Chip Duckett, a professional party planner who had organized the affair, walked to the center of the stage to begin the service. If there was any, ever any question that Spencer Cox would stop at absolutely nothing to be at the center of attention, he broke for laughter. This is it. He passed the microphone to a succession of speakers. Peter Staley had been unable to sleep the previous few nights, struggling to find the words to make sense of Cox's death and life. He placed the pages of his planned eulogy on a small lectern squinting into the harsh stage lighting to study the faces before him. He said, I first met Spencer when he started showing up at ACT UP meetings in the fall of 88. We were all so young. I was younger than most, but he was seven years my junior. He caught his breath remembering. It was a wonder watching him wow the FDA and in meetings with the biggest names in AIDS research. He earned the respect and the love of his fellow science geeks and those of us lower down on the learning curve. 20 million on standardized regimens, 20 million lives saved. It's a stunning legacy and it's so bittersweet. How could that young man confronted with his own demise respond with a level of genius that impacted millions of lives but failed to save his own? Staley spoke of Cox's last failed burst of activism and called on the weathered activists to snatch meaning from his death. While many of us, through, lack, through luck or circumstance, had landed on our feet, all of us in some way have unprocessed grief or guilt or an overwhelming sense of abandonment from a community that turned its back on us and increasingly stigmatized us. All of us, all in an attempt to pretend that AIDS wasn't a problem anymore, he said. He scanned the vacuum quiet room. 
That is Spencer's call to action, he said, and we should take it on. How to survive a plague. Thank you very much. Is Larry Kramer still alive? Is Larry Kramer still alive? Larry Kramer is still alive. He's still the biggest troublemaker in New York. And in the epidemic, I think. Um, um, yep, we still have Larry Kramer. He is a long-term survivor with HIV infection. He hated my book. He called me up to tell me that. Yeah, I, I actually knew he was going to hate the book, so I, I brought a copy over to him, and I said, you're going to hate this when you first read it, uh, but then you've got to come to understand it and like it. And he, and he called the book. Um, uh, but what I tried to find in the truth of Larry Kramer and his involvement in AIDS activism was how he did what he did, how he accomplished this, this uh, how he became the catalyst for almost everything that happened in AIDS. And he did it through a very unusual uh, strategy of uh, earning everybody's anger and hatred. Um, pissing everybody off, including AIDS patients and AIDS activists and everybody. He just did exactly the wrong thing, and it always worked. And so that's, that's the Larry Kramer that I saw in the heard, and, and he wanted me to, to know that it was all done intentionally. So that was the lecture I got after he wrote. Um, I just wanted to read something to you. It says uh, that nanoparticles containing B venom toxin melidin can destroy human HIV while at the same time leaving surrounding cells unharmed, scientists from Washington University School of Medicine reported in the March 2013 issue of Antiviral Therapy. I just want to know if you knew that or if you've done any research into that yourself. Well, I know that there's a, a, um, a lot of stuff that can kill HIV in test tubes. Um, and the, the, the secret for how to eliminate HIV is still a secret. You know, the, what, what we have, what, what was discovered in 1996, the thing that made the big difference was drugs. I can't tell if this is working. Are you hearing me okay? A combination of drugs that have only kept HIV repressed. And so what we have now is a population of people with re repressed HIV infections. But we haven't, no one has figured out yet how to eliminate it. Um, I love that people are still trying. Um, uh, and they're not trying with much vigor. There's a lot of money to be made in antiretrovirals and very little money to be made in cures. Um, the, uh, before the profit incentive um, yeah, is, is real um, and, uh, and it's encouraging people to go and try to find that. That, that cure. What, the, what a person who finds a way to eliminate an HIV infection is likely to get a Nobel Prize. Um, so that might be enough of an incentive, but it's not going to be a big payday for it. So I was really um, jolted by your, by your ending and um, with Spencer's message. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering um, what, what what your message is in that. I mean, like, I, um, I can kind of understand, um, but where do we go with that? We have to recognize, and I, uh, I, was, I was talking to somebody earlier today about this, the, um, there is a consequence to survival. Um, there, we have numerous mass death experiences, um, and we have not studied uh, the, the psychological impact and the physical impact on those who survived it. And I, I think that needs attention. I know we have a community of people worldwide who, through the, the crucible of those years, 
scarred, and those scars uh, are lacking and have not been addressed. And until they are addressed, we will see things like what happened with Spencer, who basically committed suicide, basically invited the AIDS death that he had feared all of his life and, and welcomed it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, the, I'm in the book as a, as a wit count of, and I, I, I'm first. And, um, uh, and I, I think that uh, uh, one of the things that um, needs to be brought to the, to the attention, well, I guess I had two goals working on the project. One was to, to let everybody know how bad it was, and the other was to let everybody know how good it was, you know, what was accomplished, what was achieved, what the legacy of AIDS activism, the AIDS years is, um, but also what it meant to the people who made it through and um, how difficult it was for them and still is. And so I want to make that everybody's problem so that we all are dealing together. David, first a comment, then a question. <clears throat> I was striking in the beginning of your film, and I guess it was 1986, to hear them chanting, healthcare is a right. Mm -hmm. And I think we're trying to chant that in 2017. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I think that message hasn't completely carried through. But uh, it's a message that's been going on for a long time. And then just <clears throat> the other, just a, tomorrow happens to be World AIDS Day. Um, right. So if you're heading back to New York tomorrow on the train and somebody says, um, why should I care about HIV in 2017? I hear it's a treatable disease. How do you respond to that? Um, that's a really good question. Um, uh, well, and I would say that in, if this were 1987 again, there'd be a lot of people out there throwing their bodies on the track to make sure my train doesn't get into Penn Station tomorrow on World AIDS Day. Um, unfortunately, that kind of activism um, is not um, manifesting these days. Um, you know, the, the, the epidemic continues in this country. Certainly it continues worldwide. You know, there are 40 million people living with HIV, uh, by estimation. Only half of them are on uh, these antiretrovirals. Um, and it's a miracle that we've gotten half of them on. That's a crazy success of activism that that happened, but it's only half, and the other half will die as Spencer did, will die as everyone did before 1996, and the, these very ugly, ugly deaths. Um, so that's one thing. There's still a pandemic, and we still need to pay attention to it. But also in this country, there's still a raging epidemic. There are still 35,000 new infections every year, Oh, they have the new data out, so it, w it went back, back up again, which is not so good. Um, it's been bouncing around in that area ever since 1996. You know, in 1996, it was 50,000. It stayed 50 for a while. It dipped down a little bit. Why haven't we solved that problem? Why haven't we stopped transmission? Why haven't we done what Michael Callan and Richard Berkowitz and Bobby Campbell set out to do in, in the early days of the ep epidemic, which is to empower people with information? We have every tool imaginable to prevent transmission of the virus. Um, it does not have to happen, and it's still happening. And uh, so I would draw that to people's attention on, on this World AIDS Day. I uh, enjoyed your talk greatly. Thank you. Um, one thing you're taught to appreciate as you look back was the confusion when it was first diagnosed. And I was a resident at Bethesda Naval Hospital, mm -hmm. second year resident in 1982, when we saw our first AIDS patients. We didn't know it was AIDS, wasn't called AIDS, um, but it was a seaman on a nuclear uh, submarine who had uh, multiple infections. And it was a big mystery. Uh, and for a long time, and it, uh, I don't remember precisely, but it was well more than a year, there was a a debate about what it is that was causing this, you know, this uh, epidemic. You know, it was fungal, it was, you know, as you said, repeated immune in insults. I mean, there was all, all sorts of uh, ideas. And we were concerned uh, in the Navy about the potential uh, communicability of this, uh, whatever it was, in a patient who was confined on a nuclear submarine six months underneath the sea.
but it, well, you know, it looks all so clear in retrospect. It wasn't at the time, and and I just feel a little bit. Uh, I don't think the drug companies were in any uh, type of uh, collusion not to pursue that disease. There was a lot of research going on even at at the Tessa Naval Hospital when we realized uh, what this was. And a lot of shots at you know what, what's going to work. We hadn't even identified the organism at the time. I, I think there was, you know, more effort than perhaps looks in retrospect. Um, I'm you know I know that people were doing stuff, but uh, those first mysterious cases of 41 homosexuals with a rare cancer. Um, that came on, right on the heels of an, of an earlier disease, Legionnaire's disease. And Legionnaire's disease struck one weekend, and the uh, response was remarkable. The response uh, drew hundreds of uh, EIS officers from the Centers for Disease Control to try to figure out what was going on. It, 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 a massive and very expensive undertaking uh, produced information about that disease in six months. Um, and that was, that was an outbreak that took, uh, I think it was 140 lives or something, um, and ultimately. And so we had something to compare it to. I mean, so I, I agree with you that things were happening. Uh, they, it, people were not doing absolutely nothing. But right before uh, HIV was Ebola in Africa. And people were so excited about Ebola. Um, you know, v virus hunters are are like cowboys. You know, they 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 love that um, you know, suiting up and running into danger, and and nobody was suiting up and running into danger in the same way um, uh, in HIV. Um, and in fact, the uh, uh, Reagan administration began to defund the CDC uh, immediately. Um, he rolled back their funding for travel. There, you know, we had nobody from the CDC. Um, who was coming to talk to us and coming to try to figure this stuff out. And um, I know clinicians were working, um, and clinicians, and, and that around the, the, um, the country and around the world, there were people who were well-meaning and trying to do what was right. There was no funding. Um, there was no funding for research coming out of the NIH. The first grant out of the NIH came on the third year of the epidemic. Um, and so it was really a different sort of response. You know, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to stand up here and say I know exactly that it was, you know, just disgust that caused that, um, and I don't, but um, but I know that uh, that in in comparison to those other uh, periods in time, that there that that it was a stark difference. I know Bethesda did a lot of work. Um, I I think Bob Gallo did some work down there, and Bob Gallo was one of the first people to. Uh, a researcher at the, at the National Cancer Institute was one of, the, one of the first people in the country, in the world, to take up the, the, the mad search for this new agent. And um, uh, a, a, a brilliant researcher, a flawed character, um, a man who ultimately um, slowed down AIDS research uh, for many years uh, out of greed. Um, and, you know, a very ugly chapter, but uh, f for at least those first couple of years, he drove uh, the interest in AIDS, um, and he did it out of Bethesda. Right. And Carl Jung, who used the AIDS virus to right. create a vaccine for leukemia. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really like how you touched on the fact that maybe my generation doesn't honor or remember you guys as much or what you did, which is very admirable. How do you think that we can honor that or we can fit in the shoes? That's a good question. You know, it's, it's easy to complain about something and harder to solve the problem, right? 
I don't know, you solve the problem. Um, you know, um, there, uh, for generations, there was a tradition um, in the LGBTQ family of, of a, a, it was an oral tradition of passing down our stories from generation to generation. I learned of our history, not from written books, but from, from my, when I arrived in New York, making friends who were um, uh, at all sorts of different places in their lives and who shared uh, stories that they had learned and um, a history that they had heard. And uh, so th there were, things were passed down. And what happened with AIDS is that two generations of gay men were wiped out, were wiped out. And the oral tradition broke. Um, so there's, there's a natural understanding for what happened. Um, I think what Spencer was talking about in his complaints was that he felt that the people who were infected, the older generation, those who had fought in the plague years, that they were um, ostracized, um, not just um, uh, ignored, but pushed away, pushed aside, and that upset him greatly. And um, and there is a lack of communication, I think, between our generations that we have to find a way to fix. And um, and Grinder's not going to do it. <laughs> um, so uh, so I don't know. You figure it out. Continuing on that vein and being able to honor that generation that was lost, do you think it's because of that lack of communication and handing those stories down that the numbers are going back up again? I mean, I remember what it was like back in the mid-80s, and I, I worked at Hopkins at the time with a group in infectious disease and had the opportunity to work with Tom Quinn and Mary Lou Clements and the people that were, you know, doing what we could, and it was. It was all the, all the rage. Everybody talked about it. We were handing condoms out all over the place. But I think we've become complacent. I imagine that that's true. You know, I'm actually surprised and disappointed that the numbers have gone back up. I felt what we were seeing was the beginning of a trend um, of uh, uptake of the practice of using these drugs as preventatives. PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. um, and the data suggests that more and more and more people are taking the drugs as a way to prevent infection. Um, and some of the data uh, include that other sexually transmitted diseases are skyrocketing again among men who have sex with men. Uh, but HIV was going the other way. So I don't know why HIV is going back up again. I hate those numbers that you talk about. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I was expecting like a, dro a s serious drop. Um, uh, yeah, so, so I, you know, what, what is doing it? I think certainly we're not talking about AIDS. Um, we just don't talk about it. And I don't think that it ha is, I don't think that young people need to fear the AIDS world that we live through because their world is different, and, and HIV infection is really way different today. You know, you, nobody really wants it. You sh certainly should avoid it, but, um, but it's way different. Um, so I don't, so people like Larry Kramer have this theory that he, you've got to scare people into understanding the old days so that they will not do the, right, the wrong thing, but um, I don't know how you motivate um, the message for prevention. I know that the HIV is being, um, is ricocheting in populations that aren't connected to healthcare, that are extremely young, that uh, um, they're, st they're mostly in the South, mostly among African Americans. Um, a third of them, a fourth of them are among um, African American uh, men who have sex with men, um, ages 13 to 29, so very young. And, and most of them are, don't know that they have it, for the longest time, so they're spreading it around um, all over the place, and they're not um, entering healthcare until their bodies have already 
been ravaged by the, the infection. Um, who's down there trying to make a difference? You know, I, I think it's almost going to be hand-to-hand -hand combat in order to get information to them and to get them connected to the healthcare system and the discussions that we're having out of Washington now about um, the um, Affordable Care Act are only going to make it more difficult for us to bring new people into into healthcare. Um, but that's where I would go. I would go to the south and just find those communities. You know, the, the fastest growing, the highest rates of HIV transmission are among young, very young transgender women of color, girls and women of color, and that's that's a population that's so uh, uh, endangered by so many other uh, perils in life and and is so disconnected from any sort of kind of medical care or community support that um, that uh, we really have to find ways to build bridges to them. I've been trying to think of a community that or a, a disease that's kind of the HIV epidemic of, of our current state or our current generation and the only thing that really is coming to mind is what we're calling the opioid epidemic or addiction. Um, and there's stats sometimes quoted, oh, there's more people dying than at the peak of the HIV epidemic. Um, and I'd love to see the same sort of thing coming with ACT UP out of you know, the community that's you know, suffering from addiction, but I think that it's a very different community um, if, if we can, you know, if you can call it a community. Um, and so I wanted to get your thoughts on kind of what sort of things allowed um, this whole process with ACT UP to coalesce and, and emerge as a phenomenon with HIV as opposed to other different outbreaks. And if it was sort of that stigmatization and kind of driving that group together in the first place, or, or are there other factors too that um, that kind of helped people kind of rally around and, and kind of do this themselves right. um, and spur on the rest of us? Well, I think the, the, the additional motivation is self-interest. Um, the stalwarts of ACT UP and, and uh, AIDS activism were all uh, HIV positive, and they all were fighting for their own lives. Um, and uh, although there were, I, I don't want to take away from the others who were also fighting and just as hard, but there was this idea that, that um, this desperation was very personal. So even if I wasn't positive, um, maybe my lover was sick, or maybe my best friend was sick. And in my case, my lover was sick. And um, the um, and once '96 happened, you know, once the the dying, um, the threat of death was different. The activism changed altogether, and that's the only thing that was removed was that. Um, the idea that death was certain, and so, uh, you know, you, it's, I don't know how you would translate that to the opioid crisis because um, the the people who are dying are the people who are stuck in the middle of it, and they they'd have to get out of that first individually um, in order to, f to band together. You know, I got this was a kind of an embarrassing thing for me, but um, in the middle of this war on against HIV, I got another infectious disease that was. It was so. It was. It was the. It was the unsexy ID. I was calling it. I got Lyme disease. You can't get anybody interested in Lyme disease. Um, and so, so. Uh, and but that was a community and a time, especially then in the 90s, where um, where that, that that was exploding everywhere. Nobody really. It was like HIV. Nobody knew how to diagnose it exactly. There was debates about that. Nobody knew how to treat it exactly. There was debates about that. Nobody knew what, like, um, you know, uh, uh, neurological implications were, and um, and I and I thought, well, I'm just going to get together these Lyme people, and we're going to do like the HIV people did. Well, it it, it just didn't work. <laughs> um, and uh, and I think it's because you know we weren't dying, but it's also because Lyme disease makes you kind of unappealing, I think, and we really didn't like each other, and. Um, 
But anyway, it was a survivable infection, so not to worry about me. But um, yeah, you know, actually the, the lessons of AIDS activism have been taken up by non-medical uh, causes. Uh, when, when this film came out, the, the first, one of the first calls I got was from a, a, a group uh, that was organizing uh, pro-democracy, anti-Putin protests in Moscow. It was around the time of the Pussy Riot thing going on there. And, um, and they started showing the film in these kind of underground screenings. It was really amazing. Um, um, and they would like, stop the film and they would study it. They were really looking for the lessons about what they might take from this film, the, the, the actual blueprint of activism, and, and try to, to use that. And, um, uh, and it worked for a while, obviously not in the long run. And most of those people now are, uh, are asylum seekers in New York. Um, but uh, so there have been attempts to kind of lift from this and to, to use it elsewhere. I think we were talking earlier about the idea of using it, and uh, that, that breast cancer activists took it up very er early on, and that other other um, groups like that have tried to model uh, their advocacy around um, the kind of success that that uh, AIDS activism had. But for a new uh, epidemic, I I don't know. I'd I'd love to see um, somebody try to model it for the opioid epidemic but I haven't seen it done yet. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming tonight. Um, this has been a fantastic evening. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Gilead Sciences for being our sponsor for this evening. Um, and I'd like you all to help me thank David France for being this year's distinguished lecturer. Thank you. So that concludes our evening. Um, Dave will be around a little bit um, as, we are, as we are leaving. Um, Lancaster General and Penn Medicine are hosting an event in the spring, so please keep an eye out for more information. Um, Atul Gwande will be coming in April, um, and you can find out more information about that event. So thank you all, and have a wonderful evening.